Okay, I'm um, sorry this video is way overdue, but I guess uh, it kind of went on hold when a bunch of calendar discussions started popping up around the recent turn of the Gregorian New Year. Uh, for more on that, please watch the previous video I just put out uh, titled uh, Calculated Calendars. So back to the topic of using sundials, telescopes, whatever, to observe uh, the Creator's luminaries and or his uh, timepieces per Genesis 114 in an effort to confirm his times. This past year has been an interesting journey of experimentation. Uh, it seems every solar event I've tried to observe and confirm has presented its own unique challenges. Uh, I like to think of it as treasure hunting, uh, and we're getting closer and closer. Uh, anyway, this past uh, winter solstice was uh, no exception, and I'll be sharing with you some of the things I learned this time around. And just so that everyone is aware, the basis for the theoretical target dates for the past winter solstice and the upcoming spring equinox this year comes from Jerry Morris's data and uh, his videos where he made claims regarding uh, sundial observations. I guess my whole purpose is really just to try and confirm his claims by my own observations, and I've spent the past year uh, learning and experimenting how to do that. So I'm not saying with 100% certainty that Jerry's dates are correct yet. I'm still in the process of trying to confirm them or see if I come up with something different. Uh, and just uh, just in case you aren't aware, I believe this topic is very important for us to get out there and confirm for ourselves on an individual basis. We can't keep taking other people's words for it. Uh, you know, like Google, the Washington Post, Stellarium. I've seen all of these and just all kinds of people and everyone <laughs> did this, that, and the other disagreeing as to timing of these different solar events and cycles of the sun and the star and the moon and um, it, it just seems like people are making things up you know or maybe going off of some sort of calculation and they're just ignoring the actual observable cycles of the luminaries and you know being off by one day here or there kind of has the potential to shift all of the creator's holy days so maybe that's where some of us need to start kind of, you know, leaning on the experience of others, uh, but eventually, as we all continue to grow and learn, eventually we should be proving these things for ourselves and our own observations. Uh, like the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast uh, that which is good. Okay, so let's talk about this arc picture for a minute. Uh, if you're watching and recording the pattern uh, that a specific point of a shadow makes throughout the course of the day, depending on what time of year it is, you will see one of these shapes. So for about half the year, you will see one arc, and then for one day near or on the uh, equinox, you should see a pattern very closely, if not exactly, resembling a straight line. Then you will see a flipped arc for the other half of the year. So these arc patterns will move up or down away from the straight line depending on what time of year it is on the shortest and longest days of the year, also known as the solstices. These arc patterns will reach their farthest locations from the straight line pattern that you see on the equinoxes. One additional neat uh, thing I want to mention about this pattern uh, with these two arcs and the straight line through the middle. This is the same pattern that we see with the stars. Um, you need to Google image search the phrase star trails. Uh, people have recorded and spliced together a bunch of photos tracking the stars across the night sky and these they form these patterns uh, and these circles and stuff. And the thing to notice is uh, you have uh, one circle of stars spinning uh, spinning one way in countries like North America. However, in countries like South America and Australia, you have uh, another circle of star patterns uh, spinning the other way. Uh, and in the middle, right near the equator, you appear to have a straight line pattern. So it's the same pattern you see the sun making as it moves through the portals of the heavens described in the Book of Enoch. And maybe this shouldn't be uh, surprising, considering that we call the sun itself a star, but you really need to Google image that. Uh, I couldn't 
include too many uh, uh, good photos in this video because uh, it looked like a lot of people had copyrights on their photos. But just plug into a Google image search, star trails, and then try searching star trails near the equator. And, uh, and you'll see the, the two circular patterns or arc patterns with a straight line pattern between them. And it, it's just like the pattern that the, sh the shadow of the sun makes from a sundial. Um, you can also check this out using uh, the star software Stellarium. If you set your location to uh, Pon 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 Pontanak, Indonesia, I I just Googled uh, cities on the equator, and this city comes up. Apparently, it's on the equator. Maybe it's the only one on the equator. But anyway, it's a city located on or near the equator. And if you plug that into Stellarium as your location, you should be able to see these star patterns. You'll see the circle on one side and the circle on the other, and then kind of the straight line going up the middle. And the sun does the same thing. So, so on that, uh, yeah, on a side note. Um, Thinking about these patterns and the fact that the sun also has these patterns, uh, what does that tell you about the shape of the Earth? Uh, I'm not saying flat or ball. I I haven't made up my mind yet. Um, but uh, how how would you get these sun shadow patterns? Does that make sense for a flat or a ball model or both? Let uh, let me know your thoughts. I'm curious about that. Okay, anyway, back to this uh, past winter solstice. So for uh, the winter solstice, we expect to see one of these arc patterns reach its farthest point away from the straight line pattern we saw on the equinox. Uh, this, uh, this will coincide with the shortest day of the year. And by the way, you don't need to have marks for any other solar event to confirm the occurrence of another solar event. Like, you can confirm them you know, just all by themselves. Uh, but I'm just telling you kind of where the patterns are going to be in, in relation to one another, so you kind of get a feel for it. But, um, so now I'm currently, th yeah, now I'm currently thinking the best way uh, to make sure you have observed and confirmed the correct day for the solar event is to collect three days of back-to-back -back data. Uh, theoretically, the first day you uh, see the pattern, it will be uh, in, a, in a certain location. Uh, then on the second day, the day of the theoretical solstice, it will move a little more to its farthest location away from that where the where the straight line for the equinox would be. But again, you don't need that. It, it's just going to be. It's just going to reach its highest point, its farthest point. And then on the third day of collecting data, you're going to see that pattern actually come back and land on or near the marks that you made on the first day. In other words, you will start to see the shadow pattern return from the uh, from the highest or lowest mark and this will work no matter where you are on on the earth <laughs> flat or round or whatever equator south america the 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 equinox is tricky but the solstice it's it's just one day you're gonna you're gonna see the the shadow hit this extreme point no matter where you are that that's why i say it's i think it's easier to confirm the uh, the solstices but anyway otherwise if you only collect one or two days of data, you won't really know if this pattern is still progressing one way or if it has already made its return and has already begun progressing back to the straight line of the equinox for a number of days already. I hope that makes sense. And trust me, uh, until you prove it for yourself, you need three days of back-to-back -back, uh, rolling data to confirm any of these solar events, uh, the equinoxes or the solstices, I think. So... Uh, Finally, I think uh, it's best for uh, th uh, people in three different locations on Earth to be collecting days of back-to-back -back data. Uh, one in the north, one in the south, and then one near the equator. Uh, then, if all three of those individuals come up with a solar event falling on the same day, and they have three days of data to kind of show that flip or that return of the pattern, uh, the return of the pattern, the, the flip, you'll see the flip happen uh, near the uh, e 
<laughs> the equinox. Anyway, but if you see those, if those three people came up with the same date, then I would say that that is good confirmation of the solar event. Uh, and I'm currently looking for people in the south uh, and people near the equator to help confirm this for me. So please let me know if you live in any of these locations and uh, would like to assist. My email is in the description below this video. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about what I observed and learned from this past winter solstice. Um, okay, so if you uh, if you recall my previous sundial videos, I had pretty much zeroed in on my chimney being the perfect sundial. However, uh, I voiced a concern that the sun might be so low around the time of the winter solstice that I might not get a good shadow from my chimney. So I guess I decided to use the power pole in the backyard, and uh, I guess I'll have a picture of that power pole, and then uh, you see the, the pattern that uh, it it traced uh, in the yard, and you see uh, that marked with blue flags, and it's that you can see that curve. Honestly, I... Uh, <laughs> I can't even remember why I went back to the power pole. I I think this was uh, a few days or maybe even a few weeks prior to the solstice, and I just wanted to get a general idea of where the pattern would be located uh, and confirm, you know, the general direction it was moving a week or so later, so I could just kind of get a feel for things. But it, it it didn't work. I mean, it may have worked generally to help me figure that out, but I wouldn't recommend a pole because the, the light, it does kind of just bend around it, and it just doesn't seem to be a very clear shadow. But um, in addition, I uh, also decided to try uh, the corner of my shed roof out again, and uh, and we see the pattern, I have the pattern that that traced, and at the end of that line of flags, you can kind of see the, the shadow of the roof shed kind of still on its way, making that pattern. Uh, so you can kind of see how you do it. You pick your corner and put a flag in. Um, it was at this point that I uh, started to notice something. It seemed uh, the sunlight was duller, and that might be because the uh, like not not as bright as before, and that might be because the sun was at its farthest location, or it might be because there was uh, a little bit of haze up in the sky. In any situation, this made it kind of hard to see the shadow against the grass background. Uh, and I didn't lay a board down uh, like my previous videos. I think I did that in the summer solstice video. Uh, because the last thing that was on my mind, I guess, was the success that I had from the, the, the chimney shadow and seeing how much that changed day to day. So I, I didn't think I'd have to get like that nitty gritty to get a nice flat surface with a board or whatnot. But uh, anyway... With the grass color and the grass texture variability and the dull light and the shadow and the and the lower sundial that I was working with, only 10 foot tall as opposed to my chimney shadow was 30 foot tall, it, it was really honestly very hard to tell how much movement there was after only a day gap in my data. It wasn't looking good and uh, I began to really wish I could use my chimney shadow at this point. But I started to brainstorm about uh, other sundials I could potentially use that would cast a crisper shadow on a more flat and good background color. Um, if you recall, my previous sundial was only three inches tall. It was a three inch tall nail sticking out of a board. So it seemed if I could find something that was four or five foot tall, uh, but the thing with my nail was it was a very nice flat surface. It was paper. You can the the change was very small, but it was nice and flat and good color background. You could just see it better. But so anyway, I, I figured if I could maybe find the middle ground, maybe find something four or five foot tall, uh, the, that should do the trick. That should give me enough movement cast against a nice flat surface. Uh, so uh, I, I ended up uh, turning my attention indoors to the shadows cast by my windows on the walls and floors. So I don't know if you can see in this picture, but I taped a bunch of paper to the wall uh, and then the closet and then back on the wall again between the closet doors and then back on in the closet again. And then finally, uh, eventually down uh, on the... Uh, 
and down into my living room if you look down in the corner you can kind of see it continues down there and that was about a 15 to 20 foot drop uh, from top the window up in the loft down to the living room and you know I, I did all that trying to follow the pattern the shadow traced from my window up in the loft and so I felt sure I would uh, I would get some good marks this way I had a much taller sundial with again with my window up in the loft all the way down to the living room floor and uh, and a much smoother surface and uh, background color so I imagined it would be easier for me easier to work with than the um, the dirty rotting grass out in the yard and better background color for a shadow to stand out anyway uh, the next important sundial lesson I learned was uh, that wives are not too fond of their husbands taping paper to uh, their nicely painted walls inside of their house for this I can only uh, recommend a lot of prayer and patience and uh, masking tape uh, or or something that will uh, come off the wall without pulling the paint off um, Okay, so anyway, I'm, I moved indoors at this point, uh, pretty much abandoning the outside stuff, and uh, with like one week before uh, the winter solstice, I discovered another challenge. The location of the shadow seemed to fluctuate a lot, depending on how bright the sunlight was. As I mentioned before, I think the sunlight uh, might have already been a little duller than at other times of the year because it was at its farthest location away from me. However, there also seemed to be a consistent thin layer of wispy clouds and haze way up in the heavens. This also caused the light to get duller, and on that note, I want to recommend to you again, don't wait until the last minute to start experimenting with your sundial. Do it a little in advance of the solar event you're hoping to compare, um, so that you, uh, you have some time to work out all the bugs. Anyway... I had about a, a week or at least a few days before the winter solstice and I began to notice how much the light could fluctuate depending on if um, if it was a little hazy or if you had uh, full sunlight. Especially one day when there were uh, actually spotty clouds blowing by, uh, you could really see the shadow move as the light was blocked by different shades of clouds. So just to demonstrate a little, I'll show some pictures. Um, so on this one picture I have arrows pointing uh, to the direction the shadow would move if the sunlight was full or bright and the direction it would move if it was dull uh, and it could move as much as an inch or more sometimes uh, and if you're if you're looking for only half an inch of difference or less depending on the height of your sundial um, uh, so of change in your data from day to day uh, it becomes an important factor to make sure that all of your data from day to day within your three day stretch was taken with the same percentage and consistency of sunlight. Uh, so I'm going to show more pics. You'll see how crisp some shadows look with full and bright sunlight and how diluted they look with dull sunlight. I believe the technical term for these potential dull parts of the shadow are called the umbra and the Pen penumbra <laughs> so uh, if you want to google that but um, so you just need to make sure you have consistent sunlight and that you're collecting your data consistently using the same part of the shadow and this is where the umbra and the pen penumbra come into play uh, just make sure your your lines that your marks that you're making are coming off the same part of the shadow the darkest part, I think, is what worked best for me, because um, it gets a little hazy around the edges, and so you want to make sure you're being consistent. Anyway, so my uh, my only hope at this point was that I would have full sunlight for at least some portion of those three days, but it would need to be at the same time of the day, close to the marks from the previous day, and that's why I tried to collect a wide range of data spanning pretty much the entire length of my house, so that hopefully at some point point I would have some data to be able to do an apples to apples comparison of. Uh, so I guess I, I want to mention another thing I noticed um, 
make sure you have a clear line of sight for your shadow and that nothing can potentially interfere and mess up your shadow pattern. Uh, example, I was watching the top corner of this uh, triangular shadow, uh, or I guess call it triangular light, light triangle, and uh, I noticed the shape of my triangle started to change at some point. And, and this happened for several other windows I was experimenting with in the house. And uh, I eventually uh, realized the ceiling fan was uh, blocking the path of the light. Uh, so again, uh, if you collect some data in advance instead of waiting until the last minute, you should be able to work out all the bugs and figure out what works best for you. For the other windows in the house, different things like uh, the shades uh, or curtains or, or something were causing the shadow not to be as sharp, or there was actually a shelf kind of in the way of one of the windows. <laughs> you just got to make sure you have a clear line of sight between your, your, your sundial and where you're making your marks, and there's nothing between that could kind of move your shadow around. So I think I'm going to show a couple more dull uh, shadows so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, and I just want to say that sometimes I found it helpful to trace uh, the longer lines of the shadow or the light wedge with a with a straight edge and then connect the lines to a point and remember draw if you do draw your lines like this make sure you're picking a consistent point on the umbra or pembra or whatever <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, it seemed to uh, to help me more actually accurately pick the correct point to compare uh, from day to day because I found most of my window shadows didn't actually project a sharp corner. Uh, there were they were all kind of rounded in the corners, so it was hard to know for sure if I was consistently picking the same point within that rounded curve uh, or some different point. So by drawing uh, the straight lines of the, the bigger shadow along the edges of the light wedge or whatever, I was able to, to come up with consistent points. Um, like I just connected the lines and where they made a point was uh, a good data point. So I guess I'm going to have a video kind of showing how much movement you could have for full light versus dull light and this was kind of, if I remember it was kind of a one of those days where uh, the clouds were just kind of blowing through light clouds so they'd kind of half block the sun here or there but it, it just gives you an idea of how much the shadow moves I, I think if the video is clear enough we'll see so I want to show you how much the shadow moves when the sun shines it potentially changes these marks by like half an inch to an inch. Let's see if the sun will come out here. Watch. I'll have to watch this again to see if I could tell how much it moved. <laughs> um. So. Uh, after all my efforts, uh, through, yeah, through the bright and the dull light swings, there was one set of marks where I think I had that full 100% bright sunlight so that I could make an apples-to-apple -apple comparison. So in this picture, you can see uh, the red line connecting the red dots was higher than the green line connecting the green dots, and I have the dates called out on there, so it looks like the sun reached its lowest point, which would make the shadow pattern I was looking at reach its highest point on the 19th of December, then it started to return on the 20th. Uh, and the, yeah, the, so the sun climbs higher, starts to climb higher uh, after the solstice, and when it climbs higher, the, the shadow pattern actually goes lower. Uh, to, to further demonstrate the downward motion of this shadow pattern after the shortest day of the year has passed, uh, I've been taking some pictures of the shadow uh, down in my living room over the course of the past two months, and you can, you can see how the shadow just continues to get lower and lower with every day as the sun climbs higher and higher in the sky over time, at this time of year anyway. <clears throat> 
So in conclusion, unfortunately, I don't yet feel comfortable sticking my neck out there and saying this proves or confirms the times. Uh, I still had a lot of challenges to overcome this time around, and the results I ended up with were just very close and too close to claim 100% certainty this time around. I, I don't I don't like it being that close. Uh, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to use the taller sundial next time. But uh, so so I will continue to make observations of our Creator's heavenly luminaries in an effort to confirm His times uh, using His timepieces per Genesis 1:14. In retrospect, uh, I eventually realized I could have and should have just used my chimney shadow. Uh, the shadow was pretty much uh, well, it, it was much lower and farther away from my house. It was actually down a cliff and across the creek, but I'm pretty sure it would still have worked just fine. It probably would have given me uh, an inch or two difference from day to day instead of the fraction of the inch that I was really struggling to find. Um, and next time I'm definitely going to be, yeah, so next time I'm definitely going to be using my chimney. Uh, from this point out, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, I just remember the other reason I started collecting sundial data inside my house for the winter solstice was because I wasn't sure if it was going to snow or not. You know, if it snowed, uh, it would cover up my sundial marks and I would have to shovel my whole yard consistently and not the terrain might change if it got icy or it just... I, I don't think I'd be able to gather accurate data, so so I think that's another one of the main reasons why I, I didn't think to use my chimney shadow for this, this past winter solstice. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, a couple other tips regarding this. Uh, as I mentioned, the grass is a bad background color for trying to pick out shadows, and the inconsistent texture of it also moves the shadow around with variability. Uh, this especially comes into play if you don't have a really tall sundial and your difference in data from day to day is only an inch or so. So I guess I do recommend laying a board down on the ground, uh, or if you have concrete or pavement, like in a driveway or whatnot, uh, that should work good. Something flat and consistent in color is what will work best. Uh, so if you lay a board down, make sure you don't move it from day to day or or step on it and, you know, depress it or, you know, make it go up or down or left or right or whatever. Uh, I'm talking vertically too, like if you accidentally step on it or it, you could push it down and that could change things a little bit depending on the height of your sundial. Uh, you, you, so you might want to make sure it's a, a thicker piece of wood, like a 2x8 or a 2x10, uh, and, and put them at various locations. I, I did this for my, some, my last summer solstice video, uh, to collect your three days of back-to-back -back data. Uh, a 2x10, I think, should be adequate. You, you should be able to see three days of data moving up and down on, within a 8 or 10 inch zone. Um... If you use a piece of plyboard that might uh, that might curl up on you overnight due to moisture or whatnot, uh, another tip if you're trying to confirm the times by the winter solstice, collect your marks during the brightest time of the day. So that would be somewhere around noonish or 1:30 uh, p.m.ish. Uh, one more tip. Say you were using a tall object like the corner of a really tall building, the Washington Monument, or a tall chimney or something like that. If it's a tall enough object that you're getting about one foot of difference from day to day in your data, or maybe even six inches, uh, but something, something somewhat substantial, if you're running into the challenge of having to deal with dull, obscured sunlight or your background color on the ground that you're making your marks is too too variable or too closely related to the darkness of the shadow you're you're looking for and trust me if you try it you'll know what I'm talking about but uh <laughs> There might be a trick you can use to collect your data. Uh, so the picture shows the sunlight coming down to a point, but in the top picture it shows the light kind of spreading out, um, you know, in a blur, kind of like if the light was dull. Uh, well, if you position yourself so that when you look up uh, at the obscured sun, you can kind of see where you need to stand to fully obscure the sun behind your sundial. 
uh, such as you know a chimney or a corner of a tall building or something. Then you place your hand in front of your eyes, uh, between the line of sight of your eyes and the tip of your sundial that's blocking the sun, so you kind of holds the position. Then you leave your hand in that same position and turn your head around and look down at the uh, the approximate spot you thought your sundial data should be. And then if you wave your hand a little bit, you should be able to faintly see the motion of your hand if you've got dull light. Um, and uh, it'll help you. Uh, it'll help you if you're if it's outside the shadow of your sundial. So, so this can help you find the outline or the edge of your sundial a shadow on a on a dull lit day, or if you got that tough to see variable background or something. Uh, but just remember, depending on the height of your sundial, this could fluctuate a lot. If your marks are uh, on the next day or whatever are taken with full sunlight and you took the other ones with dull sunlight so you, you need to be consistent you'll just have to experiment and get a feel for what works and what doesn't work I still hold that the Washington monuments uh, and the pyramids or tall skyscrapers will be the best sundials to be had so if you live near one of these bad boys and want to help confirm our creator's times, please get in touch with me. Uh, again, my email will be in the description below this video. I saw someone calculate the shadow for the Washington Monument, and that thing would move as much as 10 feet from day to day. So there'd really be no guessing, uh, you know, about whether even dull light or bright light. I'm pretty sure. And I mean, if you if you did a dull light, I, I'm pretty sure you could. If it's moving as much as 10 feet a day, I'm pretty sure you could use that hand shading trick I mentioned earlier, and uh, you could get a you could get some good data that way because um, it moves so much. Uh, on that note, I heard uh, something interesting the other day. Someone was saying how the old temples were built so that the sunrise could enter the front doors of the temple and shine down a long hallway back, uh, back to a wall or the Holy of Holies. Uh, and this would uh, this would only happen on a certain time of year. The rays of the sun would make that straight line from the door to the to the back or whatever, and and uh, this would be as the sun rose on the spring equinox or or maybe the day after. So it, it might have been one of the ancient ways people used to confirm the creator's times. Uh, I suppose that would only work on level ground, like if you had miles of level ground, so you could kind of see the sun rise and set on the horizon. I I know that. That doesn't work for me. I'm like tucked in the side of a mountain, so I don't see the sun until like 10 or 11 o'clock. But uh, or if you were on a mountain top, uh, was the was the temple ever built on a hill? Maybe that would uh, that would allow them to do that. I'm just throwing thoughts out there. But um, so again, uh, I don't think I've come up with anything conclusive yet. But I'm getting closer and closer, and my highest level of expectation is placed upon this upcoming summer solstice. Also, I'll be putting out a prep video for the upcoming spring equinox. If you want to start prepping for uh, before, yeah, if you want to start prepping before I put out this video, I recommend you watch my previous summer solstice video and uh, find yourself a tall sundial, like the corner of a chimney, a uh, house, church, or a store in town, or just a, you know, five, four or five-story building would be terrific. Uh, the taller, the better. And again, the Washington Monument is pretty much pretty ideal. Uh, also, I still hold that equinoxes are much harder to confirm than the solstices, but uh, we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll describe the, the, the plan of action I have in mind for that in, in the next video. Uh, but in general, it seems like things might line up again this year. Somehow, both Jerry Morris and Google seem to have come up with the same date for the spring equinox this year, March 20th. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, like, I, it doesn't seem like it should happen two years in a row, because I feel like it happened last year, but uh, something weird going on, maybe. I don't know, but that's what it seems to be this year. So, uh, so unless a bunch of truth seekers come up with different results with their sundials and confirm a different day for the spring equinox, it's, um, it's looking like the first day of the Creator's New Year will be on March 21st this year. And on that note, the only other 
possibility I see at the moment for something unexpected to happen is, again, if Jerry Morris is wrong, and there are more than 364 days in the solar year. In this case, then, I guess I would expect to see the spring equinox fall this year on either March 21st or 22nd, and again, multiple truth seekers around Earth, north, south, and equator would have to confirm that, I think, uh, and I, I kind of think it's unlikely at this point. I kind of think it's more like, and and remember what I said. Uh, the sol the equinox. I would recommend three people on Earth, South, North, and Equator. But when it comes to a solstice event, it doesn't matter where you are. You're gonna. Everyone is gonna see the shadow reach its farthest point from that straight line pattern. So. Uh, it's easier to confirm, like I said. Uh, so I'm, uh, I suppose I'll look at both time frames, uh, possibilities for, for the spring equinox this year. But like I said, I'm really thinking the summer solstice is going to be the best confirmation. So, uh, anyway, um, keep your eyes out for, uh, for my upcoming spring equinox videos. It should be soon. Um, please be sure to check out the links in the description below this video. Uh, I have links for things mentioned in this video, but also links for the whole playlist and series and, um, uh, yeah, any other, anything I mentioned, but, um, uh, so until next time, shalom, and may Abba bless you as you continually seek his truths with a pure heart.